My ballet was really, really blessed to be granted with the Knight Foundation uh, grant for this project and so they rose. Um, and that enabled um, me and my skeleton team to really create something beautiful and um, I think full body, you know, in a way that um, without funding would not have been possible. So Ma Ballet is a, a digital platform where we curate, we present, promote, yeah. and preserve the um, contributions of blacks in ballet around the world. So Southern Rose is the legacy of, or the beginning of the legacy of black Philadelphians in ballet. Um, I am from Philadelphia. I am a black ballet dancer. Um, I started at the Philadelphia um, School for Dance Arts with, with we call her Aunt Joan. Um, when Ms. Ramos from the Knight Foundation asked me, you know, what would you do? We grant these cities, what would you do? I saw Philadelphia and I knew exactly what I would do because I knew that I had a personal legacy that maybe other people didn't know that much about or I wanted to share. So I knew that I studied with Marion Sujay and when I was eight years old she told my father, take her to Pennsylvania Ballet because she could be a ballet dancer. And that's what, that's what happened, right? I knew that Judith Jameson was also from Philadelphia and had started in ballet and then got diverted into a fabulous career. I mean, if we could all have that diversion, right? Um, but she started in ballet with Marion Sujay. I knew that Joan Myers Brown had studied ballet with Sidney King. And I said, you know what? There's more there. Also, I'd like to, I can't really see, but a dear friend of mine and former dancer of Harlem uh, dancer, ballerina, is here, uh, Dr. Joselle Deans, Aldine Deans. She was also one of the people that had her dissertation was exactly on black ballerinas. And she was so generous as to um, share her information, her knowledge, her passion with me and with the project. So she's, she's a huge part of this. And it, it, it's great because we are family in, in a lot of different ways. So I'm not going to do like the whole long bio thing because I really, A, want you to engage with um, the site and get more information. And B, we have them here, and I want them to tell you who they are. Um, jo Myers Brown needs probably no introduction in Philadelphia. She is the founder and the director of the Philadelphia School of Dance Arts, as well as Philadelphia Philadelphia Dance Company. Mr. Lawrence Brown. Simon Payne. Um, <laughs> the New York Negro Ballet. Yes. And now, Judith Jameson cannot be with us today. But I have another Judy for you. And this one, this one you weren't expecting. I have Judy Sujet, who is the daughter of Miss Mary. How this is going to go down. This is a discussion. So we want to talk, we want to hear your stories, but I really do encourage you as, as audience members to participate. If you have a question, can we get a little light in the house so we can see? Um, if you have something to say, we have some, some black ballet dancers in the house. I'll call you out in a moment. Don't get nervous now. But, but I really do want you to participate and ask questions. I'm close to this, but, but if you want to know something, ask. Um, one of the things, first of all, you've had an opportunity to see the installation. What, what are some of your feelings? Oh God, I've opened myself up. Tweaky, but I think it's, you're on the right track and I'm, I'm quite proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Brown. <laughs> Brown, Brown. <laughs> Brown, Brown. Brown, Brown. Brown, Brown. <laughs> I, I was, I'm not very good at, at the electronics. And when you uh, linked me up or whatever it was, phrases are uh, on your email. I was so happy to see, first of all, the tree, uh, and to see uh, Miss Marion and Nancy, mm -hmm. and because I got to luckily work with, with Nancy uh, several different times. Wonderful, 
stories about her. And uh, Miss Sydney and Joan and Jimmy Anderson. It, it, I just love the layout. Mm -hmm. You're really on the right track. And, and Essie is, is Marion's teacher. Essie Marie Dorsey, yeah. who, who really is the seed that sort of began the tree that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that really um, intrigued me was the idea of, at this period of time, we're talking about the, the 40s, thir late 30s, 40s, the idea that segregation, how segregation worked or how it didn't work. Like when you told me that you went to mixed schools, that was, I was like, what? Um, because we think that Brown versus the Board of Education was in what, 1952? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the Philadelphia of that time, like the, the racial uh, workings? <coughs> well, you said I, I, can, I can talk a little, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it had to do with where you lived in the city. It was more geography than, than, than race. Uh, you tended to kind of be pushed in the same economic class. And I lived in what is now fancy downtown Philadelphia. It was not fancy then. It was, uh, I lived in the section that was just called South Philly. I lived 22nd in Nordane. And it was an a interesting mix. Uh, we were from Lombard Street to, I'll say, Morris Street South. From 24th Street to probably 7th or 8th Street going east, that was basically black. Mm -hmm. On the outside of that was an Irish neighborhood beyond 24th Street. On the opposite side, east, <coughs> pardon me, was uh, an Italian neighborhood. Uh, then there was a mixture of, of Jewish families within all of that. The thing that brought us together was not some common thing that we were, you know, feeling together, but it was economic. We were all in the same boat financially, and we had to go to the same district schools. We were assigned schools. So I never went to a segregated school because I lived in that neighborhood where we all went to school. So we went to school. And we interestingly went to the movie, we went to the Avon, and we segregated ourselves in the Avon. But it wasn't segregated, like, it wasn't no, like the back. we segregated ourselves. When you walked in, uh, black folks went to the left, and then there was a middle section, and we, we I, occupied the left side of the middle section. And then the white people went to the right, and to the middle section of the right. We did that ourselves. Well, you know, I'm a little older than her. <laughs> when I came up, the black folks was told to go to the black side, and the white people went to the white side. And in my block, there was all black people. In my school, there was all black people. I didn't get to a mixed school until the junior high school. And then, even in high school, by the time I got to high school, there were two black kids in my class. And both of us were named Myers, not related. But on Jewish holidays, we didn't school in clothes. The two of us would sit there and look at each other. So, um, our neighborhood was not my neighborhood here. And okay, I'm, I'm uh, 85, she's 80. Oh, no. so, right? I'm a, uh, and my experiences are entirely different. Because it was a different neighborhood. No, it wasn't so much the neighborhood because there was a Jewish store in the corner, and, and, but it, it was entirely different. I'm glad you had that nice neighborhood. <laughs> well, it wasn't such a nice neighborhood. Nobody had money. For it. It's just that we lived with each other, and we were required academically to go to those schools. So I never, growing up, I never went to an all-anything school. So here's the other thing that I found really interesting, was that these three women in the same city, relatively the same time, have very different experiences of it. Um, and for whether that's economic, whether that's uh, the color difference, um, or, or class difference, whatever, it created a whole different story. And so I think that that's something beyond the ballet aspect of it, that I found really, really fascinating. And, and, and I think sometimes we don't take that into consideration about 
the way that our history and our stories are, are formed. You know, that we can be standing side by side with someone and have a completely different experience of something. Um, can we talk about color in, in, in class and how that works? Um, especially in, in ballet, because there, were, there are opportunities that could be afforded. If you could, if you looked a certain way, or you didn't look a certain way. So your mother was known for for being, you know, with the oh she's fair. She she when the school split, she was able to rent studio space in spaces that <laughs> potentially, yeah. You yes. Tell that story. She she went to uh, Walnut Street, uh, close to Broad. Across from the old Latin Casino. I don't know if there's anybody in here who remembers the Latin Casino on Walnut Street. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were on the third floor, across from the Latin Casino. And um, on the first floor was a grand piano sales room. And we'd walk up the steps along, two flights of steps to get to her studio. And we could had a big glass picture window to look down onto Broad Street. And I suspect you're right that she got that address because she was fair. And as we would say in our family, you need to open up your big mouth. And, um, but we were only there for two years because when they found out who our clientele was, we were going after the lease. And that was the same way. We were in four places on Walnut Street. Uh, we, we went across the street where the Latin Casino is, but down across, what was that called? 12, uh, 12 something. Yeah. 12, 14. Yeah. yeah. 13, 10 first. 13, 10 first. And we were <laughs> upstairs on all of these places. Mm -hmm. Two years lease, gone after two years. And then down the street further on Broad Street on the same side, I mean on uh, Walnut Street on the same side, um, we had two stories. We were on the second floor and the third floor. And we had Mrs. Riley and um, Adise Riley and Mrs. Yeah. Baden, yeah. who made all the, the two shoes. They even had their own sewing area mm -hmm. because it was so big, the two floors. And uh, again, after, after two, two years, years. <laughs> we were gone. She made sure to sign that two-year lease. Then. Yeah, because, because my mother, being fair skin. She probably, as we would say, and I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings, don't open up your big mouth, just go and, and inquire and sign the lease. Because if they, if, if you spoke if they about knew, who or where knew, you lived or... If they knew that we were black to begin with, they would not have rent it to us. And um, after one, two, three studios on that, my mother went to local down in West Philly, cl close to where we live. Went to Chambers Street. That's right. Yes. No, first we went to Chamber Street. That was downtown. Then we were on North Broad Street, Broad Broad. where it used to be yeah. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were like three uh, buildings in. Mm -hmm. And I think it was over up over yeah, a piano that's store that's again. Yeah. yeah. We were everywhere, but it was only for two years every place because as soon as they saw mm -hmm. who we really were, and even in my family, I mean, I'm sitting here looking very fair, I know, and uh, but. I, I am a black person, and my mother was complexion like I am, but the thing that a lot of people, and this has nothing to do with ballet, I'm so sorry. No, no, <laughs> go, tell but your story. But the people, you know, it's like, you know who you are inside. You know who your many, many relatives are. You happen to have fair skin, but your heart is the heart of a person of color. And well, she I, she 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 would tell us as students be like, I'm just as black as you are. That's that's exactly. And be like, okay, <laughs> that just proved it. <laughs> I, I know it's just a teach for me and some of the parents to say, you know that white lady. I said, I'm sorry, she's not white. We're not white. She's not white. She's just fair. You know. But it, it, but it, sorry. No, no, that's all right. It's I. I think it's important for us to hear because Marion Sujet using that mm -hmm. that privilege 
was able to expose her students and give her students different opportunities of training because she could slip by. Ms. Brown, would you tell the story of, of, of how you integrated ballet arts at Carnegie? Oh, yeah. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was actually, people. actually it's, it, it's two brief ones. The first one, when I was, I did the first time I did a solo at 14. Um, since we were downtown, people used to come by the studio. Remember, and hire, they rent, hire us to do performances. Renee Brent, one year, uh, came to the school and asked Miss Marion to uh, bring some performers to a luncheon that they had. Little did they know. She had her way of teaching without talking. So instead of bringing our Dunham class or a jazz and tap class, she brought me and I did the Dying Swan. Uh -huh. And she did the original choreography because we had a George Chaffee uh, teaching us some of the original work and a live and pianist instead of a record player. Uh -huh. So that was her way of teaching instead of um, just sending in a bunch of kids to tap and entertain them. They had to digest this brown girl uh -huh. doing the Dying Swan <laughs> and doing the original do choreography. When we went to uh, Ballet Arts, that was really amazing. She went before we went, got our class cards, and signed us in, and then we appeared. So they thought that it was a summer program, and uh, young people from all over the country were coming to New York to Ballet Arts, which was in Carnegie Hall. And I appeared, and they thought I was going to be somebody else. So they tried to direct me in another direction. And what had Miss Tuesday told you? Nothing. No, she said, don't, don't. No, she didn't say anything. She just gave me my class schedule and said that's what, what I was to do. And if you knew Miss Marion, I never was afraid of her exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I did cross her. So even though this, I, I was 15, and I'm standing in front of this woman telling me to go someplace else, and I'm thinking, I don't care who you are. I'm not going back and tell Miss Marion. <laughs> I have my card. It's paid for. I'm going in here. And if I'm not going in here, then you're giving me back my money. Please tell about the partnering. Oh, the partnering. So that was harrowing. Um, we had part of our schedule. We had we had point. We had technique class, and we had partnering. Uh, in that era, you didn't have very many men, period. So there were maybe four or five men in the whole class with 20, 25 girls. Uh, the first partnering class we had, the teacher called uh, the women up. And then she called the men. He called the men, rather, was Dubidowski. Nobody would come behind us. So Miss Marion said, OK, that's all right. You know, we're ready to cry and run out of the room. So we will get behind each other, and we'll hold on to each other. And we had about 15 men at that time, which was extraordinary in Philadelphia. We will teach them what we learned here, and we'll take that back. That only lasted for one week. The next week, we went back, and the best man in the class came behind me and said, Mr. Brown. And that was the end of, of that. Didn't she, when you first went to the partnering class, she partnered you? I, 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 I no, we, we just part, yeah, we did partner each other. Right, yeah. yeah. We, we, it, and not very well, because we weren't. <laughs> we're not guys. We could pick up each other, we couldn't do much. Now, uh, I cannot call you Aunt Joan. <laughs> but, but Everybody you, calls you Aunt Joan. There are a few other things they call me, too. Aunt Joan is, uh, or Jamie. You're the, you're the only one that actually went to the, the Sydney Marion School. Of dance, correct? No, Judy. Oh, that's oh, yeah, true. That's true. So, can you talk about their partnership and what what that was like? Well, it was a, I got there the last year they were together. They were only together one year. Yeah, forty nine is when I got there, and uh, because Miss Sydney was teaching you the day I first day I went there, uh, and I thought she was a white girl. <laughs> but uh, then they split. But my mother knew Miss Sydney. So, and then I stayed at Sydney. But it ended up that during this time, all the brown girls ended up at Sydney's, except for a few, and then the other girls went to Marion's. Because it was also an economic balance, too. Most of the doctors, lawyers, and all their kids went to Judamar. 
and most of the kids that stayed at Sydney's, we were all like, you know, just average kids. So, but when I got to Sydney's, I had had some training at high school with uh, Miss Langenfeld. Virginia. Can you talk yeah. about? Yeah. Can you talk about the dance club? So this is one of the things that's very unique about Philadelphia is that the arts was so plentiful here, and the, the artists. There were so many artists, both music and like from opera, musicians, opera, opera singers, ballet dancers, that tell them about the clubs. I won't talk about it. You tell them. Well, I think I went to the club first. But I'm older. This thing about her, she had been a, a member of the Littlefield Captain Littlefield Ballet Company. And in those days when you uh, stopped dancing, you became a teacher. You didn't go to college for dance, you went, so she was a physical education teacher. She was our gym teacher. She was. And in our gym classes, and it all went down through all of us, mm -hmm. uh, even after me, <laughs> that she would do uh, ballet dances in the, in, in the gym class. You know, we all did ballet, whether you did ballet or not. And she invited me to the ballet club, and she said, you should dance. I said, well, I can dance. She said, no, you should dance. Come to the ballet club. So when I got there, I was me, the only black girl, and everybody was like, what are you doing here? I had the slightest idea about that. I, I didn't know my mother took me to Esther Marie Dorsey when I was young, because everybody went to Miss Essie's dancing school, mm -hmm. and I, I would speak to Miss Essie's. I, my mother took me out after the first week because I lost my ballet slip, and she said, I don't have another dollar that you sent. You can't go back. Mm -hmm. But uh, So that was my dance career. But Miss Lingerfelter put me in the club, and I decided if I'm going to come to the ballet club, I better go to the ballet class. And I went up and down every school on Walnut, Chestnut Street, trying to find a school. None of them would take black youngsters. <laughs> so I had a girlfriend who, um, her name was Virginia, Virginia Turigian. She said, if you come to school early, I'll teach you what I learned in my school yesterday. And then when they start the, in the ballet club, you had some idea what's going on. You know, I know what a sea song is because Virginia taught me. So I learned a lot from Virginia. Um, so by the time I got to Sydney's, I knew a little bit more than the rest of the girls. Uh, so I started teaching for her, and that's how I started teaching. But um, then I wanted to go to Marion's, but I couldn't go because first of all, my mother couldn't afford it. And second of all, I thought only ice cream people were over there. No. Because that was my opinion. That was my opinion. Then I, then I met the Boris, and I said, oh. <laughs> it's, not, it's not so, because Philadelphia, back in the day, there was a, a color it thing. Light skin and brown skin people, we got to have to, that is honest. It might not be just back in the day. Yeah. But it, <laughs> so, so the brown skin people, you know. We just, Wait, okay. Yeah, it happened, I just, it was going on. Yeah, I just want to say, it's with, with the color thing, um, I was, I one of the luckiest people on the planet how I started having formal training. I started in junior high school. Uh, a woman named Miss Weir, also a gym teacher, <laughs> she came down to um, was teaching the back. We had these wonderful clubs, and I was in the ballet club. I went in in eighth grade, and when I say luckiest people, um, Miss Marion, and she brought Judy, was a little girl, to a performance, a student performance, and gave three of us a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And what she was looking for when the <coughs> partnership split was it appeared most of the younger girls, uh, when the teenage girls stayed with Miss Sydney and the younger girls came with Miss Marion, she was looking for more teenage girls, older girls. And uh, none of us were, you know, we were four figure. We were brown skinned girls. So I didn't, I didn't know about that, but um, I was just very lucky to be in the right place at the right time, and she came to that, that particular performance. And from that point on, uh, for me, it was magic. And, and Judy, were you in the dance clubs as well? In yes, school? I went to West Philly too. Mm -hmm. So you guys were in the same West Philly. Yeah, we all we went. Yeah, we all. Yes, and I danced year. under yeah. Virginia Lingenfelder. Yeah. And when I was a senior, um, I finally got a leading part. I was the dying girl in Death and Transfiguration. Oh, God. <laughs> and I got yeah. to walk. Somebody else went to West Philly and remembers that? <laughs> 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 
this is the, the last part, the <laughs> last part of the ballet. Yeah. They have these steps. They have great scenery. And the dying girl goes up the steps <laughs> and then collapses. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. But um, um, my mother was a mother. She cooked spaghetti, loved it, spaghetti sauce rather, spaghetti sauce. She had all kinds of, we had all kinds of favorite meals. She was a mother at home as well as a ballet teacher. And in her studio, she always had a pot. Joan yeah. has a pot. Yeah. I, a couple years ago, I taught for two years uh, some youngsters for Joan. And um, every time I would get there, Joan had a pot of food cooking on in her kitchen, and my mother did the same thing. She'd always have a pot of food. And for any teachers or anybody else, but mostly it was other teachers went in there, and then family who went down to the studio so we could see our mother. You know? And uh, when my father worked the books, he came, my father taught school and worked in the post office too, and he would come to the studio and do the books and wait for us and he'd be cleaning up as my mother was polishing the, the mirrors before we all left and we'd get back home on Friday night. It was the biggest night because we had adult dancers that took class and we'd get home around 11 o'clock at night and uh, it, it was a family business and my mother's parents lived with us and they really raised us so that my mother could have the dancing school. Um, can you talk about the sense of community, because in all of their stories, there is this incredible through line of your strong family unit, and then also the extended family that's either in the actual community or specifically in the dance community. And how how do you see that time? And, and how, do this? how do you see what was happening then? either not reflected, or what do we need now, in terms of community? I don't know what you need as far as community now, because I ended up, after quite a few years um, in the so-called dance world, I ended up as an English teacher <laughs> in New Jersey, and um, with, you know, a family also, and, um, I feel that all the people that came through my mother's studio were family. I got help from homework from all kinds, male dancers, female dancers. Um, if there was uh, anybody who had no place to go Christmas Eve or Christmas Day that were students, especially adult students or other teachers, adults, they would be at our house. You talk about how Judith Jamison's mother helped you. Can you talk about the Mother's Club and, 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 and that sort of thing inside the, the dance school? Well, due to my school had a, had a Mother's Club that would help with a lot of different things that people didn't particularly know about. And I auditioned at 17 with School of American Ballet classes. And I was told by the Wait, what year was that, please? That was uh, 1953. Did you hear her? She, she auditioned in 1953 for the School of American Ballet and got in. I just want you to hear that. Picture 1953, School of American Ballet, and what it looks like today. And this was 1950. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I was told that um, if, by the Mother's Club, if I got in, they would give me the car fare and they would give me some uh, spending money for the first six months that I was there. So at the recital that year. Oh, gosh. They gave me a, a wonderful card, which I still have, with a ballerina on it, and wishing me well. And that was Judith Jamison's mother mm. was the president of the Mother's Club at that time. Mm. So I, one of my responsibilities in the school was to teach the younger students. Judy was 
TJ was in that class, Judy Jamerson, um, Donna Lowe. It was about, what, 10 girls? Probably yeah. about 10 girls. And that was my responsibility. So I felt very uh, a part of them, of those little, because that was my first experience to be responsible for teaching and knowing that they were a generation under me, that to be responsible for what I was doing and to be serious, and for the Mother's Club then to give me that start. Well, I did go, I did get in, and I was told it was really hair raising, because I was told by the administration there that if I didn't go into C, which was advanced, I wouldn't come into the school because I was too old. She was 17. That was 17. But I did get so, so part of what part of what I'm trying to do is like myth bust. There's a myth about you know black bodies can't do ballet, right? There's there's a myth about um, economic. Like it, it, there's always this thing about well the black people are too poor. Like we always our stories always turn into an old Negro spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> and part of that's true, but it's not the whole story. And so, like, I hate to get hashtag, but hashtag black excellence, black joy, you know, black girl magic, all that. But it, it is true, and I think that we don't, our holistic story isn't often presented. Because I see the beauty and the artistry and the elegance and the intelligence, the integrity um, of all of you women and, and your mother and the generation before. Um, and yet we don't know about that. And oftentimes when we talk about it, we only talk about what you couldn't do or what didn't happen instead of looking at actually what did and how amazing that it did happen. Does that make sense? Um, can we just, is there any questions or comments? My question is, why encourage your parents to keep following every time? Because I'm going to keep on that time, it was kind of dangerous probably. Mm -hmm. Having Question. Um, black kids coming to a neighborhood that's not for black kids, so it's probably a major. So what pushed your parents to say, you know what, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep following every time she moves. Dangerous. It, it, it wasn't dangerous. dangerous. It, it was wasn't broad. It was it was Walnut Street between Broad and um, okay. well, it was from uh, 15. 13 to, 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 to. It wasn't da a day. I think she's talking about like you're assuming that racially because yes. because no, it, nobody you, was attacking right. So about. that's what I think no. is so amazing about this yeah. specific Philadelphia experience mm -hmm. is that in our minds we're like ooh segregation. Mm -hmm. We see you know crosses what burning, cake. like that's what I'm saying. It, it wasn't exactly the way we have been taught that living in that time of segregation. It, it was no, nobody ever attacked no. me. I, I would leave the studio even as a 14, 15 year old girl at night to, to walk home because she didn't get enough coffee. Uh, and I'd walk all the way down, you know, downtown and nobody ever assaulted me. I never heard of anybody uh, attack. I, nobody even verbally said anything to us. No. They noticed that we were coming and didn't want us there, but nobody actually frontally attacked us or, or did anything to us. We went to we went to buy ballet clothes at at, 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 at Bones that was right there. Right Nobody the said, Yeah, we just where did. couldn't you go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where couldn't you go? Well, the only the only problem that we had was in our regular life was uh, there were a few shops that weren't welcoming. Um, that's all. I, I mean, I, when we went out to buy a sandwich, you know, we just said you can't buy a sandwich here. That's what's amazing. Oh, so, please here, uh, here. Oh, my parents used to tell me they lived in South Philly. They didn't have that type of problem in South Philadelphia. But there was areas of, of Philadelphia that did have problems, and we call it sundown. That was in the Kensington area. After the sun goes down, black folks could not be in it. Even though they were a section up, Kenzie said it was a predominantly black neighborhood. You had black neighborhoods in Germantown. You, you had those black communities and whites lived surrounding and you didn't have those type of problems at all as far as racial um, fighting or anything of the such. 
but you still kept yourself separated. You did. But, you know, you have to also separated. think of the, the time. Period. Yes. Because as time went along, things changed. Yes. You know, I lived in a time, me as a teenager, where it was totally, I know, we could not walk to school unless it was more than three of us and move and walk to a white neighborhood. Mm. With that, you, 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 the, the certain streets you didn't go across alone. But we're talking about Center City, yeah, where, they were located, where mm -hmm. there was always a constant flow of traffic and mixture of people, so they probably would, didn't have that problem of going in and out of the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never did. Another but Philadelphia is still very segregated. I mean, it's very segregated. I think it's more so. But it, it, okay, so it, 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 it changes. Yeah. Like the city morphs, and so the, the lines get drawn different ways, and, and economics and whatever's happening in the country probably pay a, a huge part. In, I mean, look what we're look at today. <laughs> you see, so you know, so we've been talking about family. I think I think we want to get back to that because this happens in dancing schools that we create a family. Yes. And that, you know, I got a loaf of bread on the table, if I don't, because if you're hungry, eat. So you still got to dance. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make sure you get to class. And we're going to make sure you have the best teachers, even my kids. You know, now, today, I still do the same thing, which I learned from your mom. Right. You know, it's a family, and that we want to produce excellence in that family, and we make sure that happens in the family. And uh, even though there was a period where people were, uh, territorial with their dancers. If you went to cities, you didn't go to Marion's. You know, and then we had some Marion. I, I had always tried to dance better than Lois Brown, <laughs> you know, because she was over at Judah But we were still friends, you know, but we had that uh, honest, uh, what do you call rivalry. But we were still striving to be good at what we were doing. And our teachers were trying to make sure we were good. Sydney was a, uh, uh, a nurturer, uh, she kept you close. Marion was a go-getter and spread her out. And I wanted to be with Marion, but my mom said, you got to stay with Miss Lydia. You know, so it was, it was difficult. I never went to New York till I went to Dunham. Mm -hmm. But Miss Marion taught me so many things mm -hmm. without sitting down and lecturing. Uh, the example that I talked about earlier of going to a Brene Brith luncheon and instead of doing what they probably expected would be, she, she said, I'm going to teach you all, including teaching me something. Uh, this is also who we are. We're also ballet people. We don't just do uh, other kinds of dance, but we're classical ballet dancers. And she, she really, I, I was so fortunate to have her as my first teacher because it was your whole self. It was how you presented yourself. Uh, your education was important to her. How you, how you carried yourself in the world. Uh, she would be on your life. You can't believe if your clothes weren't clean. Everything had to be uh, the best you could be. And I never got a feeling when I was studying with anybody. I never felt a competition of anyone. I always felt a competition with me. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be better than me the next time. If I always had a goal, if I was doing double pirouettes, I wanted to do triple. If I was doing 20 fortes, I wanted to do 32. And that's the kind of energy. Class was almost like a, a, a sports event in a way. I mean, we would start turning and just keep upping our game with jumping. We'd just work higher and higher. But I felt. It was the whole person that I got from Miss Mary. It was everything you were supposed to be. When you present yourself to the theater, and I took that with me as a professional, when you come out of the backstage door, look like what the person standing there trying to get your autograph imagines. Don't come out looking like you fell off some truck or something. <laughs> you know, try to, try to carry that, that through, because that's, that's who you were. So let that be your whole self. So at this point, can we bring up the house life a little bit? Mm. Um, we have a we have some black ballet dancers mm. here. They're like ooh stars. <laughs> so I, I wanna I'm gonna I'm sorry Robert. I'm gonna, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
Sure. Before I get to that point. So, could, uh, Julia. I love what you, you're talking about, about what you got as, not just as the technique of dance, not just the technique of dance, but also what you got <coughs> that stayed with you for the rest of your life. Like, you know, when you're, when you go through the stage door, be the person that they want, you know. And I feel like we're losing that. And I feel like it all draws, almost. Like, so I'm just curious, what value do you see that we might be losing? Or what value do you see about letting it go? You know, that formality of all of it, on stage and off stage. You mean me personally? Uh, I, 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 I felt that every lesson that I learned from having clean tights to having my, my ballet, to this day, I've worked for Joan for 41 years. <laughs> and um, I never, ever presented myself as a teacher with my street clothes on or with baggy pants or with no ballet slippers. <laughs> So I thought it was important to present myself. I wanted to I wanted them to give me to. I wanted us both. If I could come on time and I could present myself a certain way, then I expected the same thing back. Yes. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't ask you to be something that I wasn't willing to be. I could certainly come with my proper clothes. I could certainly present myself a certain way. I could use the language of, of ballet properly. Um, it, it's important to do, to pass that on, and I was very lucky to have my first teacher be Mary and Sujet, because I, I can't imagine where my life would have gone. I mean, the first time I went with the Negro Ballet to Great Britain, I got invited to a wonderful uh, dinner party at a mansion. And the thing that was so wonderful was I could walk in and feel very comfortable in my skin that I was invited there. And I didn't feel awkward at all. I felt very good about it. And I didn't have to be shy around the people. I was prepared because I, I was wearing what, what I should wear to the party. Uh, I felt comfortable in myself. And that I got at ballet school. Not just at home. Wait, can you can you talk a little bit about the, the tea dances? Jude Jansen talked about um, that your mother would do uh, sometimes tea dances to teach social skills. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? No. Because <laughs> 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 she was younger too. Well, Judith Jameson said well, that she would do a tea. Okay, sure. okay, I'll, I'll do it this way. Right. You said that was the mother's club. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That was the mother's yeah, club. The mother's club would do tea yeah. dancing. Yeah. They would do that. So how did kids learn with social your grace? Yeah. With yes. your whole self. Yeah. Yes, your whole self. Yeah. Yeah. How the students, down. the University yeah. of the yeah. Arts yeah. students, your whole self. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I, I think table. too that you could go to art class, you could go to dancing class, you could take piano lessons, and after the lesson, that's the last thing you have to do with that teacher until you go back again. But Miss Sydney, my mother, people like George Chaffe, mm -hmm. uh, it was your whole life, your, your whole life. And it wasn't just at the ballet room. It was a community. It was like we were all family. The people that came to my mother's studio, we were all one family. And we learned so many things besides Tandu and Tia and so forth. Um, we, we learned to treat, and it wasn't a lesson given us, it was just the way that the school was run. And the beingness. Yes, of, we, we, we respected each other. And um, we, we supported each other. And it passed on into our regular lives, our so-called regular lives. Yeah, but our regular life was really in dance. Yeah. I got it. I mean, I I am a product of of all of you. Like I like I was three years old when I went to study at Aunt Jones. I was eight when I had your mother. Like I and I've always wondered why I was this way. And now in listening to your stories and getting to really like dig deep, now I kind of understand.
understand what Brenda Dixon Godchild was talking about, the audaciousness. But you know, I, I want to end with that too, because for years it was easy to do that. It was easy to say, you got to dress right, you got to mm -hmm. comb your hair, mm -hmm. you got to comb clean. Mamas are different. Mm -hmm. I had mamas backing you up when you tried to teach your children mm -hmm. what to do. Mamas don't even come into school no more, they drop off. Mm -hmm. And the kids, I have to take them in the dress room and comb their hair. Mm -hmm. Or if I try to correct them, you know, I'm told that's not my job. But even with the company members, I'm like, why you got that on? Hmm. You're with, you're on the job. You, there's a whole different shift mm -hmm. in what is happening with our yeah. world. Mm -hmm. In the world. And it's making it hard for dance teachers mm -hmm. to say, manners matter. Mm -hmm. Dressing matters, come here. I don't want that mohawk on my stage. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, it's entirely different. The times have changed. Tommy, you can tell it. Tommy can tell it. And I, when I say they call me a few other names, it's because of your demand that you try to make. And it was, it's not so much a demand, it's an ask and an embrace. For the greater good as yes, well. Yes. So I want to, Robert, would you mind saying a, a few words? I have a few, few of my dance theater of Harlem folk here, um, in, including Giselle, but also Robert Garland, who's the resident choreographer. Of but he's also a Philadelphian and also a, an alum of Phil Danco. So I know you have some things to say. Can we get the gentleman here in the leather, the yes, leather sports coat? Oh my. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. That's your mother? That's mom. Mom! Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's wonderful listening because, of course, I did dance for Philodanko. Um, one of the wonderful things about, I think, my time here with Philodanko and, and what I learned about being an artistic director or a person that's delivering artistic direction was that there were times that Joe Myers Brown made choices that were not necessarily to benefit the audience that she was developing, but to develop us as artists. So I had the opportunity to work with William Dollar, who was an original member of New York City Ballet, in Joe Myers Brown's studio, dancing to Stravinsky. You know, I also danced with Roy Tobias there. He taught classes, another original. In fact, Roy Tobias taught Arthur Mitchell all of his roles before he left New York City Ballet. So, so those people I had, in addition to the African-American choreographers, Billy Wilson, of course, Tally Baby, so that uh, my experience by the time I got to New York was much, uh, I was much more finished in terms of my, my, what I had than a lot of other uh, uh, people that were around me at that time. And of course, you know, my ballet teacher there, Dolores Brown, you know, and, and she put me behind a woman that I found out was my cousin, the one, Debbie Manning, you know, who at the time I did not know was my cousin. So, uh, so, so yeah, so it's uh, wonderful being here and hearing all this. The webmaster for Dance in Harlem now, her name is Leslie, and her last name is Sujet. Yes, and she is related to uh, Miss Marion as well. So it is all in full circle, so, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> oh, Joselle, can you, yeah. Did you have something to say? No, well, I, I had a, another thought earlier on, but uh, speaking to the family, um, having taught at, at uh, Philadelphia School um, and the company, and having been uh, trained at Dance Theater of Harlem, the African American dance schools, no matter what they're doing, no matter what type of an organization it is, there is always this familial um, training of the entire person. You know, the, the dress codes, the, the, the how you have to speak. The, the Arthur Mitchell said, if you don't get an A, you can forget it, okay? You lose your scholarships if you don't have your academic grades together. So it, 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 it permeates our culture. And that when we have our dance schools, and that nurtures the person, as Ms. Brown was talking about. But what I also wanted to bring up is Ms. Brown said that she, um, um, and Teresa pointed out to us that she was in uh, SAB in the 50s. 
But what, what we found as we were doing the research that was interesting is when she was in SAB, most of the teachers were of Russian descent because they were all friends of Balanchi. There were a couple of other Europeans. There were no Americans. So her experience as a, as a from a teacher-student point of view, was very different from, let's say, who I spoke to about this, Hinton Battle, who came years later, where at this point there are all American teachers at SAB, and what kind of treatment they were getting and what, they, what was happening. So there's that whole thing, too. Who's doing the teaching? In my research of 20 years now, it's always very interesting that those older, well-known European teachers were most often more recept receptive and nurturing to the black dancers than were the American born ones. That's exactly what happened to us with Anthony too. Yes. And he came to Philadelphia and uh, taught up in Frankfurt uh, when I went up there because my girlfriend said you should come to my aunt's studio. He didn't have a problem with me walking in as a black girl into that classroom. And he was talking about partnering, but none of the guys were partnering. Mr. Tudor was my partner. I learned in Sleeping Beauty how to do it. He put us there because he was European. Right. He didn't have that same American right. thing going. Mm -hmm. Can I just mention something about Tudor? Um, I discovered in, in more recent history that that was always part of Tudor's uh, sensibility. I went to, oh, probably 10 years now uh, to the uh, Royal Ballet in, in London. And he, they did a ballet, and I was just thunderstruck. The lead in the ballet was supposed to have a little, I look back in, in, in the, the um, uh, books, not the program, yeah, in the program. And I saw, I forgot the, the dancer now, it's going out of my, he had a little black afro. Well, I saw Carlos Acosta do it. So it was a ballet from the 40s that he had choreographed with that in mind already. So that was way before he met any of us. I, I had the honor of working in the Ballet Guild as a, as a full member. Um, and he, and like Joan said, he didn't have a problem. Explain the Ballet Guild. Oh, the Philadelphia Ballet Guild was a precursor to what is the Pennsylvania Ballet now. And uh, there were four, actually, four of us. It was uh, John Jones, Billy Wilson, me, and Betsy Dickerson. And um, I never felt I didn't belong there. I didn't felt, feel odd. Uh, Tudor was very strange to get along. It was the Valley Hill that brought yeah. Tudor to Philadelphia. The Valley that, Hill. That I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. I didn't that know. Yeah. The Valley Hill. Yeah. That was the school. Oh. That brought him to but Philadelphia. Was, yeah. oh, I didn't so go to Frankfurt. Hill stuck, I didn't stuck, go to Frankfurt. Went after yeah, the I went, initial. Yeah, I went after that. I never yeah. went to Frankfurt. That's when John yeah. Jones and Billy and all went after I left. That's yeah. when it was still the Valley Guild. I didn't know about what's, that. What's, what's interesting is um, a, a, a few months ago, um, uh, my friend Andrea Long, who's also a, a Philadelphian, Right, trained at, at Pennsylvania Ballet, then went on to dance for New York City Ballet, and then danced at the Harlem. Um, but she was at. She, she, <laughs> <laughs> where all good things start. Um, she she was like, oh my God, Teresa, have you seen this? And it was a review um, of the Washington Ballet of Ashley Murphy in Lilac Garden, and it's a Tudor ballet. And it's really, I mean, if you, has anybody seen it, know it, it it's oh, yes. really unrequited love. Yeah. It takes place in a garden, you know, somebody's having an affair with this one and that one and love, but, you know, she doesn't want to marry him, yeah. she doesn't love somebody else. It's a love story. Turn the century. Yeah. yeah. Turn the century. Yeah. Yeah. So this, you know, this critic wrote, because Ashley Murphy, who was a very chocolate, lovely ballerina, was in the lead, and her male partner was a white male, um, he remarked that it made it an interracial um, couple, and it was to distraction for him. Wow. Um, and it, he, he said, 
it, it was not what Anthony Tudor was trying to project when he uh, choreographed this ballet of, of English society. Let's see. Yeah, but the interracial problem with this man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, the problem, the problem is that when you write a critique like that, you should research your history of who the person is. He obviously did not know anything really about Anthony Tudor. I didn't even realize how Tudor's bent toward being open to anybody until I went and saw that particular. Problem. I got him straight, Miss Brown. Okay. <laughs> I got it. Because I thought about it and I was like, well, that's very interesting. I wrote, I write for Dance Magazine and I, and I wrote about um, cultural bias um, in, in dance critique. And I said, well, you don't have a problem when there are white people doing Chinese and Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. and then they, I don't know, right? Arabian. You don't have a problem with that, but somehow it's to distraction. <laughs> you know, and I was, I said, well, is it, is it the fact yeah, But you also don't have a problem. Having a very big fat woman in yes. that butterfly being, you know, small Not a Asian person. So I just thought it was very interesting. I wanted to take the moment to just point that out because societally we have that thing. And he felt it was comfortable. He felt comfortable enough. And somebody also felt, like his editor didn't say, <laughs> that it was, it was okay. And in the theater, where it's supposed to be willing suspension of disbelief, right? This is, you know, he was like, it's the period. Well, the lilac garden takes place in a lilac garden. They bloom. <laughs> the only thing that really tells you about the period are the costumes. And not every production has the, the, the actual the costumes of the era. So really, you're just talking about a love story. But for him, it was something else. And I felt like his comment said, well, then, then you would have a problem with any other brown girl, male or female, in a role opposite another. A fair person. Right. Giselle. Further with Tudor, that's interesting because he did a, a ballet name called Undertow. And it's a very difficult, it's a very deep ballet. And he gave the lead in his second setting of it on the American Ballet Theater to then quarter ballet, African American dancer, Anna Benna Sims. Yeah. Nobody said anything because the person that she was dancing was a person of ill repute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't have an issue there. The, 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 um, the different um, uh, critiques were not there because this was a very strong personality, so I guess she was fitting the bill of what a black woman should be. I find that really but interesting. But Joselle, unfortunately, she is a beautiful dancer. I got to know her. Uh, we don't have the privilege of having had her talent stay in America because she was not given that opportunity. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm she saying went right out of ballet theater. Tudor, no, but yeah. to speak to, to what she's saying about Tudor, I think Tudor was always Exactly. They are, they're, yes. they're placing things yeah. on Tudor that isn't true. Exactly. Yeah. What he said to her, and I have quoted in my research, is this is the kind of role that when you do it, you become a ballerina. Mm -hmm. And she could never do it. Like you said, she had to go to Europe. Yeah. So I think he was putting things on Tudor, number one. And number two, it was interesting when Tudor did give roles to black women, Depending on the role, it depended on what, what they said. Well, Mr. Tudor told me, he said, if you are serious about ballet and you want to, you're going to have to leave Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. He said, you're going to have to go somewhere else. He said, I don't know where that somewhere else is, but you're going to have to leave Philadelphia. My mom wouldn't have me. <laughs> Anybody, uh, other comments over oh, here? Yeah, um, no, um, just because you were talking about roles, I know you mentioned the dying woman that falls on the stairs, but I would just love to know um, for all three of you, um, what was your favorite thing that you've ever uh, portrayed on stage and maybe why? Mm -hmm. Well, I never, I never got to be a ballerina on stage. I know. Uh, but I, my favorite role was, was with Billy Wilson. And a cotillion here in Philadelphia. Let's yeah. let's get into it. We'll talk about the we'll talk about the cotillions. But do you want to say your favorite role as well? I had a lot. <laughs> I had a lot. Um, one of my favorite roles, which 
people didn't get to see too many. Uh, Alvin Ailey did a uh, Odyssey, three women and three men. Uh, it was lovely, South American composer. And we auditioned for that one too. Um, the other thing I think, uh, to, speaking of Tally Beatty, I got to do, um, he did a, a, a ballet legend about uh, a horse culture, women, where women were dominant. I like that role, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Because one of my other, other favorite would be Bert Panada. You know, that was, um, I did, oh, John Jones, that Bernard. yeah. That was Bernard, and uh, Bert Panada was one of them. Because I got to do it with the whole live music, tiara, <laughs> royal theater, you know, the whole nine yards. So I, I guess that with that opening, I think oh, this is probably your favorite thing. Mm -hmm. But I have a bunch. Well, I wasn't the dancer that these. Well, I mean, no. we want to talk about the cotillion. Oh, oh wait, well, that's wait. what I'm getting ready to. Okay. Well, my, my, my favorite, favorite, my favorite, also was with Billy Wilson. Yeah, Billy Wilson. Huh? <laughs> very, very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and a wonderful dancer <laughs> and a gorgeous body. <laughs> Play a role of Margarita, Margareta, or whatever it was, and he was Pietro. This was for the Cotillion Ballet. So, so, so and let, fill us in on what exactly the Cotillions were, because this is fascinating too. Well, Eugene Wayman Jones, who was a music professor at Temple, he had this grand idea of having a Christmas Cotillion, and of course, it was predominantly for us people. <laughs> And it was wonderful, and it was, you look forward to Christmas time, you look forward to the rehearsals. They had a huge number of high school students that did the cotillion waltz every year. Our men were in tuxedos. Our women were in ball gowns. And on the tremendous floor of, um, what's was it, the convention, convention Hall. Convention. Convention. You don't know where that, but you, most of you don't probably was remember that. Study. It's been knocked down. Yeah. And um, here we are. And, and, and the dancers were all high school students um, doing a cotillion waltz. Our people in gowns and in tux. And they looked so gorgeous on the floor. And we had Eugene Wayman Jones a fair skin, <laughs> black man, black man, black man, who was a professor at Penn, a music professor, and um, he was able to get members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, but not Mr. Ormandy, Ormandy um, to play for the entire evening. We had a whole ballet story that Dr. Jones had. Uh, concocted in his head. We were in the most gorgeous costumes. The floor was tremendous. It was not a stage. It was, you know what... Um, oh, like the ice could be. Yeah. The people are up in the balconies looking down on us. Gorgeous wooden floor and his stories were always fairy tales. The one, of course, that I just admitted to, I was Margarita <laughs> and uh, Billy was Pietro. And of course, there were love dances between us and, and my family, meaning the dancers, you know, that uh, presented me to him and his family. It was lovely, the little story. But um, at the very end, of course, we were all stage at this point. We came on in a carriage with this white horse pulling us down the whole length of Convention Hall, yeah. Billy and I. <laughs> <laughs> Down to the, right to the audience that was on the ground level, and the horse turned. It was a person that was walking the horse, a trainer. And the, the horse turned, and as he turned, you know what he did? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, every Christmas for quite a few years, I would say about six years. Yeah. The most remarkable thing I remember the thing, Dolores Brown parade from one end of that convention hall to the other. It's long. <laughs> I mean, that was like a football 
Back leg, back leg, back leg, back leg. <laughs> well, I remember when we did the Blue Venus. Yes. And you rose from the basement of Convention Hall on a, uh, it, was, it was the orchestra pit that went down. The hydraulic, yeah. Yes. And Dolores was on it with a backdrop that looked like the ocean. And she rose up from this, and it was like, you know what, they didn't give me that part. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fantastic. And then she, I mean, not just her ballet training, but she, like, I am somebody. And we all felt like that. We all felt like that at dancing school. I think that's one of the things that, no matter whether it was Miss Sydney School, my mother's school, Olive Bowser, remember Olive Bowser School, or any other, any other school that took in mostly black young men and young women. This was something at that time in history that we were the most important. And we were made to feel like no one could sing better, no one could dance better, no one could play the violin better. We were our own people, our own people. And of course, times have changed and other folks have assimilated into us and we've assimilated into them. But in those times when there was still segregation, mm -hmm. this was a glorious time. And they would give awards, they gave an award, award the Pearl Buck. Pearl Buck. And, and, and the Mary of yeah. India. He would give these awards that would just you know, make it a spectacular evening. Right. And then, you know, that's when I used to choreograph, I choreographed half the Blue Venus for Sydney. Mm -hmm. So the, so the two schools, the Judamar school and the Sydney school, would, would combine. They would do like their sections and they would combine. And they, they would do a full length story ballet. And they full on props, costumes, hydraulics. I mean, it was, it was a spectacular. It was. It was a spectacular event. And I know that everybody else who danced in it, whatever big part or small part, mm -hmm. We were something special. We were really something special because it was in a time when uh, a lot of black children, we didn't get certain opportunities. Mm -hmm. I was um, in the second grade at the Emlyn School in um, Mount 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 Germantown. Mount 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 right. And uh, we were doing Hansel and Gretel. The school was doing Hansel and Gretel. And I remember, sis, oh brother, brother, come and dance with me. Both my hands I offer thee. Right foot first, left foot second, round about and back again. And I loved it. And my mother had a dancing school where we did jeté top of eight on the race on the But I just thought, you know, this was my school and my classmates and my teachers, and I did my little part, and I knew I, I, I never messed up because I had some experience on the stage. And all of a sudden, I couldn't do it because the mother of the little boy didn't want me, with my yellow skin even, <laughs> to dance with her son. And I didn't get a chance to do it. And I'll never forget that feeling because I knew, I knew my little partner. And I treated my, my partner well. I didn't try to upstage him or anything because I had learned from my mom. And the only reason, and my classroom teacher took me aside and told me, and so I couldn't dance the little part with a bunch of other kids on the stage, we all had partners, because uh, I was black and, and he wasn't allowed to dance with me. And Teresa, I have to, because this is 1949, 48, when I was in junior high school. Mm -hmm. And there's so many contradictions. The lady talked about us being safe. Remember the photographs I showed you from the newspaper of me in, in, uh, in Cinnamon Beauty for yes. junior high school? That was junior high school, Barrett Junior High School. And guess who my partner was? Because boys didn't study here. A tall white girl. <laughs> was my partner. So our stories are so 
interesting about what race meant then, because I'm having all these different kind of adventures. I mean, I didn't even remember I did that. I hate to say maybe the brain just went south. I, but while I was digging through stuff and trying to remember dates and things, I came across that yeah. I gave to you. Dave. Yeah. Yeah. The, the newspaper articles. I made the newspaper that year. And this talk about how your brain goes south. I thought I was in the chorus. Turned out I was the Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> and I didn't remember it until I saw the article. And, and there is my partner, this tall white girl. Because boys didn't dance. Boys wouldn't dare. I mean, Billy Wilson tells wonderful stories about walking hippie hop out of his house with his gym bag to ballet school. <laughs> so they wouldn't know that he was going to dancing school. You know, but you know, Billy, I had to make I had to make Billy take ballet because all he wanted to take was tap because he said he wasn't putting on them tights. <laughs> so I let him put on tights with his swim trunks so that he would do that. And I promised him if he danced with Jackie Hartman, who he loved, oh, yes. that the, he could do it if it was the ballet dance. And you know, I had that same story again with Zane Booker. Always uh, not yes. wanting uh, to yeah. be ballet dancers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Billy Wilson ended up with the uh, Royal Ballet in, 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 in Holland. Left in Holland, St. Booker ended up in a Montico Ballet, the Montico Carla. But you know, Dolores' stories are just so different from mine. And, and I don't know if it's a matter of five years or a neighborhood. Yeah. Because that's I was all black. I was all black. And I was a treated black. <laughs> but I think that that's, but I, and I, I think was, that I was, but I was just treated like I was fortunate yeah. enough, whatever the time was, whatever the circumstances were, uh, they developed differently. I, mean, I don't know why. And this is why I think it's so important just to share. Because I know that, how many of, of you in here even knew about the, the history of the cotillions here in Black Society? No, a few no, I've heard of the Cotillion. Oh, you know, I've heard of But like, oh, like it doesn't, it, it doesn't even, for me, it doesn't even really matter. But there are Cotillions still going on. Yes. We're talking about the Cotillion in 1949. At Christmas time. At Christmas, yeah. 48, 49. When it was at the convention center. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a different yeah. Cotillion. Yeah. Let's go here. Pardon me? Was I born at? I was going to Southwest off of Grace Ferry Avenue, 47th and Wood Pascal Avenue. And, you know, around my neighborhood, it was white and red. They ran stores, but I was in a black neighborhood, and everything we did, I, I can tell you, I didn't know anything about mixed until I went to junior high school, and I got my ass kicked regularly. Here we go. I'm here with my daughter and her daughter, my daughter's friend. They've been dancing since they were three, so the last nine years. So I've been supporting my daughter on her journey. And it's been interesting how it's taken my life's path. I've recently been appointed to the board of the Pennsylvania Ballet. And I would have never thought that would have happened in a million years. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm one of two people of color on the board. But what's my role in that is I'm, I'm taking from a community economic development, community bent, where I want to make sure the ballet gets into the community to um, allow our brown and black children to dance and to give them opportunities because since I've been following with my daughter on her journey, I hear the stories about how it's hard to be a, um, a person of color in the dance field professionally. And so I'm, 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 I share that because I'm curious to know how, what other routes can one do um, to, to, to open up the doors for dancers of color. I know what my charge is. I'm going to use the ballet as a platform. To, they're getting, we're getting ready to um, build a school and to make sure we get into our communities to make sure that we, to make sure that we bring in ch um, children of color to open up, not just for the dance, but for all the life skills they learn from being in, in ballet. I, you know, I have to interject this, and I, you know, I hate to feel like I'm always negative, but I'm real. Uh, the Pennsylvania Ballet had a big grant to go into the community. All the teachers that go into the community are from Philadelphia. They don't send their ballerinas into the community. They've got to send those little girls 
to show that you can be this, not just because somebody can teach you ballet in the school. They got, you got to make sure they send those white girls into our schools, too. Yeah. Do we you know just can't send Teddy, uh, Karen Pendergrass and Bonnie Bing out to, to the black schools. So if I could interject, as a board member. A new, very new board member at that. You're, you're in a wonderful position. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and what I would encourage is if they're planning to build a school in in the community for the community. On North Broad like, Street. On North about, North you know, mm -hmm. it's for our then make sure that there's that it's equitable. And that's what she's saying. Make sure that your that, that faculty not only reflects the community that they're that they're teaching, but also the training is equitable. And that that experience is equitable. That the same rules apply. You don't come in here with shorts in your hair like this, that, and the other. Right. If you were going to the real camp, the, the original campus, you have the same exact experience because a lot of what's happening with outreach is separate and not equal. That's yeah. right. And, and that's what I'm saying. Why not send my teachers there? Why not send your teachers? And, and, and access is, and exposure and access are two different things. Are two different Absolutely. things. Okay. So that's something that you can really, if, if you can get in there, they want to do that. As the voice of color, that's something that I would encourage you really to like, be like full stop. That's what it has to be. I'm just on the other side of all of this, as you well know. I made a, a, a kind of a, a faith to myself that I would not cross the doors of New York City Ballet or American Ballet Theater in my life again until the stage reflected the society. And I tell you why. When I first started in ballet, I was not the first. Uh, the first persons that I knew about from a wonderful mentor that I had, Joe Nash, was back in the 30s. Women of color and men of color were, were in ballet, seriously. They were as good as the people of that era. They were built like the people of that era. You know, we get judged uh, a lot of times by what the current day New York City Ballet looked like. New York City Ballet did not look like that. That's not what his inspirations were. I have tons of books on what the original inspiration for his masterpieces were. You grow out of that everything, sports, people are taller, faster, you know, it, it grows out of that. I don't have the courage to do what I would like to do, and I'll tell you that, I'm not sure that with anybody. I'd like to make a big poster and put all the names of the board members of these companies and march up and down and say, prove who you are. I, want their I don't want the dancers, I don't want the director, I want the board members, because if you can put your name on something that you're saying, I intentionally leave these number of people out, then good on you, because that's what I want to see. Not, not the under people, because I've been told, and I don't even know if it's true, the reason the companies are not fully integrated or reflective of society is because the board doesn't want it. And put the board's name up there. Let them have a name. Don't they have this anonymous, the board? You know, I want, I want those people's names out there because I will never again go to any of those companies because it breaks my heart every time I see a new notice that somebody has been elevated in New York City Ballet, one person. What do we do every 25 years? We elevate a man, no women. So that's my thing. I want the board people to put their money where their mouth is. Uh, up here. Hi, my name is Erica the Q. Um, um, I want to first say that um, uh, Joe Myers Brown, who was right, you may have uh, <coughs> not known me, but I went to IVD with him in Colorado, and you both have some um, granted me scholarships for me to attend University of the Arts, and I'm forever grateful oh, for by saying that um, recently I have went through a um, devastating loss of my mother and I sort of have lost like my passion for dance and oh. just sort of trying to get that back together so I just wanted to say oh ags 
What have you learned and realized about yourself and in your artistry while being in this particular field? And what's kept you in the field? Mm, good question. Well, let's talk, let's talk about that. Dolores established a scholarship fund uh, it was the International Association of Blacks and Dancers, which I started celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And she said, this is money to give some scholarship to some guys in the memory of John Jones. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the guys, so thank you. And so, uh, and one of the boys said, I took your money. <laughs> <laughs> and help Ivory just got a job in Chicago. Oh, so, good, good. you know, the, guy, the guys, you know, the guys get a lot of breaks girls don't get. So this, but you know, it's still not equitable or equal. But last year we started in um, Zendra, Colorado, two years ago now, uh, auditions for girls of color because uh, I had a teacher tell me, I said, How come I, well, let, me, let me go back a minute because I don't want to make it too long. But the Regional Dance America, which is a ballet association, was giving me an award. So I got to the award, received the award, and there's 600 little white girls. And I'm like, well, where are the black girls? Mm -hmm. This is a ballet association. So I spoke to the girl who started. I said, how come there's no black girls? She said, oh, we don't know where to find them. <laughs> I'm like, well, shit, I'll find them for you. <laughs> so we, we put out a call for black girls who did ballet to come to Denver. And we're going to audition for the major ballet companies. We had Dayton, I mean, Dayton Ballet, Denver Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, Ballet Theater, the Lewis Brown toy for class. And the girls turned up and, and turned out. It was 101 black girls. So we had two girls come from Haiti that were taking ballet class in the same <laughs> class. Joffrey Ballet that year gave 20 scholarships. And this year, in my knowledge, from my knowledge, it might have happened and I don't know about it, Pennsylvania Valley, for the first time, there's two black girls in it mm -hmm. at the same time. Yes. <laughs> they always have a guy. Pennsylvania Valley alum, front row, just saying. Can you say this very, very quickly? When, when we talk about the isms, and <coughs> it's not a criticism of a person who has worked in a company. When you're hired, like I don't like to criticize people for having a job. So I don't criticize the dancers. They don't make, you know, they don't make policy. So it, it, what has happened to us that we don't always recognize, people don't understand the difference between integration and tokenism. So you put a person at the top of the pole and give them wonderful things to do and elevate them, that's fine. That person's not guilty of anything but being an excellent artist. And I am 500% behind it, except I won't spend a dime to see them. But I'm 500% behind what they do. Because as a dancer, I know myself, I just went and did my job. I wasn't in the politics of it. I just showed up to try to do the best that I can do. So we can support that, but I will not support going back and signing autographs and being hugely in a house. That doesn't reflect us. That gives us one person. You know, when do we understand, do we understand, all of us, whatever color you are or background of whoever you are, do you understand the difference between power and what that kind of power is. That when you say, I am going to give you what you will be satisfied with. So they give you that dancer. A young man has just been elevated in New York City Ballet to principal. I just read it online. So that was Arthur Mitchell. Then what was it, Edwards? Al Albert. 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 Albert, yes. And now this young man. Three. And Mel was the soloist. No, so, yeah. But you know what I like your quote, Dolores Brown, you say, I won't be satisfied until the ballet companies look like America. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, and we none of us should be happy. Because do you realize the people that we have never gotten to see? Mm -hmm. the, the Asian dancers. I went to see, uh, I was invited as a alum to New York City Ballet School. And I watched a class, and there were three little Japanese girls, exquisite, absolutely beautiful. They were about 14 years old. 
and leap forward, you know, 15 years, they should be in the company. No, I don't see any Japanese girls in the court of ballet. <laughs> they got a Japanese principal in the Royal Ballet. What does that say? And just like you said about illusion, she's Japanese, she's doing Swan Lake. Well, so what? She, she's absolutely fantastic and absolutely beautiful. When I say people, Joan and I were talking about girls of color. Remember how many white girls showed up to the audition? Right. And a friend of mine said, what are the white girls doing? I said, well, they have color. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have the problem that you're having because they are, these are friends of yours and we all, they all came to the audition and they auditioned like everybody else. We should not do that. We should really, if the playing field needs to be, if I can cut it, I should have the job. And trust me, when the Negro Ballet went to Britain and we performed in all the Royal Opera Houses, not one person ran out screaming when they saw us on the stage. <laughs> you know, so it, it's, and that was British, and that was a long time ago. You know, in all fairness, let's say, if there's a ballet audition, there's going to be 500 or white girls. Sure, sure. And there's going to be two or three black girls. But they're, they're trying just as hard, everybody's trying hard, but you want to pick out who's the best and who's the most qualified, not looking at color, you know, and that has to happen, and it still does not happen. No. So, so IABD, International Association of Blacks in, in, in Dance, they're having um, their uh, annual conference. Okay, go on the website. And this year, they're doing a ballet audition for females and for males. So spread that that word out there and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience and we do have some of the top tier company like multi-tier from Pacific Northwest Ballet yeah. to uh, San Francisco, San Francisco Ballet yeah. to oh, like yeah. a yeah. Ballet Memphis yeah. like so yeah. there are a lot of different yeah. a lot of different yeah. options um, we're, we're we have to wrap but you see why I love these ladies yeah um,